I'm Kate Moore. I'm an almost finished student here at the undergraduate school. And it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce Maria Bushkin today. Just a little bit of background. Marina received her BA in journalism from Moscow University mm -hmm. and uh, arrived here in the United States in 1994, following in her younger brother's footsteps. And she came along with her mother and her son and uh, moved what, within three miles of the undergraduate school. It was in Hopkins, and she said she, you were, I thought this was great for me to cook this. Welfare bound and culturally aphasic, and desperately needing guidance. And you also wanted to go to school, and you needed a school to be within walking distance because she didn't know how to drive, she didn't know how to write a check, and she didn't know how to make any money so she could write a check. And uh, she said, challenging her firstbornness, she asked her brother for advice. And he told her there was a graduate school three miles from her apartment. And that was the Alfred Adler Institute of Minnesota. And she, I love this line, there were so many places we would never miss in life if we just walked. <laughs> and so what she did was she came to the other graduate school, she received her master's degree, she went on to get her PhD in clinical psychology through Capella University, and now she's a member of the faculty here. Um, and I asked her, so well, what's the focus of your work? And she said, well, the focus of my work is thinking and making things more complicated with each day, <laughs> by the way of thinking. I totally get this. <laughs> I, know. I still don't get this. <laughs> I don't like to do it alone, though, so I like to think along with my clients, students, and those family members that are not tired of me. <laughs> and she also talked about how she believes in the magic of a story. She said, I like to wrap my teaching in a good story and fill my teaching with an even better story. I'm inspired when my students succeed. I like difficult questions and challenging clinical vignettes presented by students. I don't know anything more stimulating than that. And so today, uh, Marie is going to talk about Adler on War and Peace. And she said she likes to view Adler's life and his writing as well as others' lives and writings in the historical and relational context. There, in these contexts and their dynamic interplay, she finds the origin of many Adlerian concepts, social interest being the one of them. There, on a crossroads of religious, ethnic, and political multiversity of the 19th and early 20th century. By the way, I'm not used to reading Roman numerals, I thought, is that 19th and early 20th? Yeah. That's one of the ways of making life complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so at least I got that one. I find the most modern language to explain painful everyday reality of wars fought in the 21st century. So it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Marina Bluchstein speaking on Adler on War and Peace. Thank you. Uh, well, one of the. <laughs> well, that's kind of premature. <laughs> uh, well, following the, the purposefulness of behavioral, I, I, I purposefully use uh, Roman numerals because I felt people will stop and think and walk for that. Because if you use Arabic numerals, you drive for that. <laughs> That's the way you want for that. The case you, you think about that. Uh, well, to challenge my uh, willingness to walk and not to miss things, other graduate school moved to Richmond from Hopkins. So, uh, and I'm not claiming that I'm walking here. I am not. I'm driving. <laughs> uh, so there is a little change in just personal circumstances, I guess. So I, I, I really do profit in that way, so I, I like that way to stay. That way, and, but I'm willing to drive wherever Adler will move, and I hope it's not going to move for far away, but I'm willing to drive. Uh, I like to view uh, Adler's life uh, in his writing in historical and relational context. In historical sense, Adler's life and his contribution should be viewed through the lenses of two wars, two war wars. His earlier writing was in many ways inspired by the World War I. Its onset, the horror of, of its human cost, and dishonorable for all closure. Then, in the early period, a cloud of World War II started growing. There, in that small window between two wars, the concept of social interest, the communal spirit, the communal connectedness and embeddedness was born. I feel personally connected to this topic on both historical and relational aspects of Adler's life. My great-grandfather, a soldier in the Russian army, found his future wife 
an Austrian Roma gypsy mm -hmm. when he was in Balkans as a part of the Russian army. Uh, two decades later, a half of my, ex uh, of my extended family, the way my extended family existed at that time, was wiped out the face of the earth by the Holocaust of the World War II. As a result of that, I never saw two of my grandparents. The World War I, for me, in my personal family history, was about building bridges. The World War II, in my personal, in my family history, was about burning bridges. There, between two world wars, between building bridges and burning bridges, my family heritage was defined. Adam's life can also be seen in a relational context. And some people around the Adler Graduate School encouraged me, teasingly perhaps, to act as Arisa Adler. <laughs> Probably, I think, and I think they have good intention at that, because I think they believe that Arisa's accent was perhaps as beautifully halting as mine. <laughs> uh, despite Arisa's brilliance, of course, and I don't want to deny her that, I really struggle, and maybe it's a denial, but I cannot really find myself in Raisa. Just try and can't, and try and can't, and they really cannot. Uh, a recent article by Henry Stein helped me to find myself in Adler's family, because I really wanted to find myself in Adler's family somehow. In a really unusual way, Henry Stein described Adler's demeanor as one of the gentle grandmother. And I couldn't believe my eyes when I first read that. I read that and you read that and said, a grandmother, not a grandfather, a grandmother? Yes, Henry Stein wrote about a gentle demeanor of a grandmother. So somewhere between this gentle grandmothering of Dr. Adler and a revolutionary passion of Mrs. Adler, I found my way and my place, my emotional way and my emotional place in Adler's family. War and peace is a topic that I can see as a thread through all the others writing, both in his earlier years and later in his life. I googled it. <laughs> in a third of a second, Google search turned in 954 millions entries on war and 410 million entries of peace. Isn't that significant? Interestingly though, it's changing every day. I tried it every day for several days and it's changing, but it still remains uh, a half. And I didn't, when I went to Google it, I didn't expect anything. I thought, okay, I just want to see, I was curious. What is it going to show me? What is it going to give me? And this is what it gave me. A virtual space, a virtual universe, is filled with war, not with peace. Try Googling pictures of war. You'll get graphics. Try Googling pictures of peace. The best you'll find is a couple of really fuzzy, not really specific symbols, all holding hands at the very best. Nothing that would really touch, nothing that would really make a person feel attached and personally connected and personally embedded in that. And a really abstract, really intellectual level, not on a personal level, not on a cellular level, as a work feature would find anybody who would attempt to try to go beyond the warning or graphic nature of the pictures and go and look uh, at those pictures. The war begins. That is an event takes place opposed to human reason and to human nature. Millions of men perpetrate against one another such innumerable crimes, frauds, thieves, and murders, and a whole century are not recorded 
in the annals of all the law courts of the world, but with those who committed them do not at the time regard as being crimes. 1869, Lev Tolstoy, born in peace. 1869, in Adler's life, that was the year, just one year, before the Adler was born. He was born the following year, 1817. What produced this extraordinary occurrence? What were its causes? That still tells Tolstoy's questions. War. And so there was no one cause for that occurrence, but it had to occur because it had to. Millions of men, renouncing their human feeling and reason, had to go from west to east to slay their fellows, just as some centuries previously, Hordes of men had come from east to west, slaying their fellows. 1869, war and peace. If we didn't know, that was written in 19th century. I wouldn't guess. I would say it would have written in 12th century, in 15th century, in 19th century, in 20th century, in 21st century. Things don't change. Things don't change. Adler witnessed the full blow of the World War I and died when a cloud of World War II was already upon Europe. Across Europe, about six million men received orders in early August for active duty. Within Vienna and almost everywhere, the popular mood was almost euphoric with patriotic, patriotic excitement. <clears throat> the war started in the summer of 1914, and uh, at about that time, a little bit shortly before, Adler started writing about community feeling. He already wrote about community feeling. There was a community feeling in his writing at that time. And uh, interestingly enough, that patriotic excitement that for some really felt and sounded like social interest because everybody were together. There was no difference between conservatives and Democrats, between, between poor and rich, between native Guineas and people who came abroad. They were all in there together. All fights, everything was forgotten. Somehow, Adler really never felt a part of that crowd. The crowd was so huge that even Freud who normally stayed a little bit aside, well, he didn't stay aside, he stayed above the crowds. <laughs> Freud wrote at that time, all my libido is given to Astor Hungary. That's how strongly he felt a part of that crowd. Adam felt some feeling, but not that feeling, not that patriotic euphoria. Interestingly enough, and for me, in really adherent sense, in really specific, a way that nobody else would do. Adler uh, called upon several of his friends and followers and students and said, you know what, the war is coming and there will be food shortages. Let's do what? Let's get some funds together, let's get some money together and let's start planting gardens wherever things can grow and let's get a couple of rabbits. And one of his friends said, so why rabbits? Well, right, because they reproduce really fast and they really eat you know, pretty much anything you put to them. So they got some money together and they hired a, a countryman to watch over this pair of rabbits, hoping for like, more rabbits and more meat and more uh, life coming. And they started planting vegetable gardens where things could grow. A uh, couple weeks later, they start, started calling from this countryman asking, so how are the rabbits doing? Them? You know, what's happening? What's going on there? Any, any upsprings? Yeah. Uh, and week after week, there were some tales about whether it were foxes or hails or rats or shortage of food or something. There was always a reason not to come and to look at how rabbits were doing. So finally, Adam <laughs> got tired of uh, not being able to look because he was so extremely, so excited about that. And it was a project. They did it together. 
So they went to check on rabbits. Uh, there were no rabbits there. Uh, but uh, there were a couple of new kids that this countryman uh, 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 got during the time. I don't know how it was probably last of the year or so, sounds like. Uh, so Adler, uh, who was really uh, unbeaten optimist, he said, well, if these are some offsprings, maybe not rabbits, but some people offsprings. So the, the, he was not really, he was not really disappointed by that. But for me, when I read that story, uh, that was such a manifestation of Adler doing, and not just talking about community feeling, but doing community feeling, acting community feeling, practicing community feeling, in a real way that he could connect to anybody, and anybody could connect with him. <coughs> there was, however, some disconnect uh, in how Ander felt about his surrounding. His usual professional circle of uh, Beanie's style academicians and doctors was replaced with army doctors. He was drafted in 1915, uh, and he served in three places between 1915 and 1917, like the late 1917. Uh, the people who normally surrounded him at the topic that they would normally discuss those people didn't surround him anymore. The topics weren't discussed anymore. And one of the this first hospitals where Edward served as a, uh, as a doctor, uh, his duty could be described, as we would now say, uh, assessing uh, fitness to serve. So he was supposed to assess soldiers uh, who were recovering from psychological and physical trauma and see whether or not they can be ready to go back to combat. And he felt such incongruence uh, with the tasks that he was supposed to perform. The doctors that surrounded him were all preoccupied with the topic of malingering mm -hmm. and the uh, things uh, that they used uh, because the task was, of course, not to assess. The task was to get as many soldiers back to the battlefield as possible. And uh, the way it was done at the time, uh, uh, most of the time it was shock treatment that was used. Uh, cold showers, mock surgeries, and the task was to replace the anxiety, uh, to show that anxiety over um, treatment, about treatment, uh, to make it stronger than anxiety over going back to war. So the people, the soldiers would say, okay, I'd rather go there than to wait when the next cold shower, shower or electric shock treatment would be, uh, would be administered on me. And Adder was right in the middle of all of that. Uh, he felt so terribly about that. Uh, he wrote later that during the uh, neuropsych night type round that he was supposed to do, uh, he saw so much human suffering. He saw so much pain that he never had uh, dreams anymore. Hoffman wrote a little much later that Adler, Adler shared with many people that he didn't see, dream, he didn't have night dreams, he didn't have dreams anymore. And Hoffman wrote that Adler perhaps didn't have dreams because everything was resolved. But people do see dreams when things aren't resolved. So when you don't see dreams anymore, don't remember dreams anymore, then it's all resolved. That's what I read in Hoffman. Adler shared with people who knew him personally that this experience of, around, of neuropsych rounds at night was so traumatic that somehow that deprived him the, the safety maybe of uh, having those dreams. That at least what he uh, was able to share with uh, people who know him. Uh, now, yeah. now publicly, wasn't his public uh, statement on this is that once he understood the function of dreams, he no longer needed to dream? Right, right. And Hoffman probably went from that statement uh, that because there is no function, things been solved, things been resolved. So there is really no need so because they don't serve any purpose, any purpose anymore. Uh, those were more immediate. Right after the war, it comes and sharing that Adler that is available to us. We can only speak of what uh, of the information that is available to us. The people who share their yeah, their experiences. The community patients uh, that Adler used to see and like to see so much before the war. They were replaced with soldiers that were physically, psychologically wounded. 
and being assessed for fitness to return to the battle, uh, uh, battleground. Many Russian friends and colleagues left. First of all, they were enemies, right? They couldn't stay in Vienna anymore because they were on a different side of the war. Second of all, they were so busy. Remember, it was 1916, 1917. They had a greater task at their hands. They really needed to take care of Tsar, and they were all busy and excited preparing the, uh, the Russian Socialist Revolution. So they all left, and there was a really natural chemistry that Adler lived in for so many years in Vienna and enjoyed on a professional level and on a personal level through his wife and through his wife's friends that he, he didn't have it anymore. He was deprived of it, so he, he didn't have this natural solution, this natural uh, thing that he lived in. And then the family relationship, some of the people uh, account, uh, shared later the family relationship was strained, and there was a really traumatic separation during the summer through December of 1914. Raisa took all four kids at the beginning of the summer and went with them that was before the war started, took them to Smolensk to see her family and spent the summer in a summer house with four kids. And this is when the war started. Adam felt the war is starting. He had an unusual, probably, for many people at that time, intuition, he felt it somewhere in the air. He telegrammed Raisa to come back. She replied, shall wait. That was her style. Other style was can't wait anymore. Her style was shall wait. Uh, and they waited until the war actually started. And they couldn't get back because it was a front line right between them. Uh, she felt extremely uncomfortable there in Russia because she was an Austrian doctor's wife with four Austrian doctor's children. He felt uncomfortable in Vienna, even being surrounded by friends and colleagues, because Raisa was somewhere. Through great efforts in several months and for several countries, somewhere close to December of 1914, Raisa and children were able to get back to Vienna. She did it by deceit. She got audience with a czar and convinced him that she was pressed and forced to marry Adler. And she's going back to Austria, not because she's an Austrian citizen and proud of Austrian citizenship and want to be there, but because she's just uh, following your spousal duty. <laughs> and that was so highly regarded across the front lines. So she was allowed, she was allowed to rejoin. But even after she came back, there were some straits because Raisa, uh, she, she, she believed that the allies cause was superior and Adler uh, was still devoted to uh, Austria. And even though she, even though he, he, he hated the war, but uh, he was a proud citizen. And there were some discussions and there were uh, some conflicts along the, along the party lines. There was also some disillusionment at that time. He didn't feel a part of Vinny's euphoric patriotism, and I call it loss of innocence. He was discouraged by the news of Russian Bolshevism, and he wrote in 1918, intoxication of power has seduced them. We see former friends, all brave fellow travelers in dizzy heights, seduced by the power drive that aroused everywhere the demand for power, and he was really disturbed <laughs> for the striving for power, extremely disturbed, especially seeing that in his old friend, friends, in Trotsky, Yofe, and Skoblov. And he was also continuously being disturbed by what he saw in trenches and hospitals, because he continued to serve for uh, 1917. Somewhere around 1916, he said, the way of relating need to be changed. Embeddedness in lar larger life need to be established. People need to include others. And uh, a recollection of, of 1916, approximately 1916 recollection, uh, when sitting in a cafe, one of the elders friends asked him, now Adler, a friend, go out to you. What have you got that's good to bring us? 
it seems to me, Adler said, that what the world chiefly wants today is a social interest. You have to say it for us. Come on, I'll say it. Later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what a platitude in the middle of the war. Here they were, these big brains of Vienna, hard-beaten intellectuals, scientists, writers, teachers, journalists, waiting for the wisdom of a great philosopher. And what did he offer them? A mere generalization of goodwill, a religious word, almost such a word as a, a revivalist preacher might be fool enough to shout at a crowd of emotional women. But those who knew Adler, those who knew him best, listened carefully, for they were well aware that when he said, what the world needs, this or that, he would be prepared to give it, give it to them. The difference between a platitude and a truth is, after all, only that between the unconvertible fact stated and a deeply experienced fact felt. Fact stated versus fact felt. Fact stated, we all catchers. Fact felt. This is what should be happening now. A little later after that, Adler in one of his articles defined war as abused social interest. In 1917, roughly at the time when most of his Russian friends were busy doing the Russian Revolution, Adler did his own revolution. He was still deeply impacted by the best of utopian socialism. And his revolution was not the one that produced communal kitchen, a fact stated. His revolution was the one that produced communal interest, a fact felt. In 1994, Kurt Adler wrote that from the war experience, Adler came to the conclusion that only one thing can save us, never believe in any authority. That was, there was another war coming in late 20th and early 30s. Nazi was not just a bad joke any longer. Following the crash of the United States stock market, Europe was sinking in social unrest. Once again, the war was in the air, and once again, Adler was able to feel it. But he was more equipped, it sounds like, to deal with that. Because even though there was a lot of disconnection in his personal life, Raisa was really reluctant to join him in the United States. She did eventually, but it took some years for him to keep calling her, you need to leave, you need to leave, you need to leave. You need to leave. He was somewhat disconnected linguistically. He was an immigrant. He spoke with an accent. And earlier in his United States career, some people were mocking his uh, accent and make fun of him because he sounded funny. He sounded strange. He never, was never afraid and he took a great courage in just going and talking. And the greatest pain and the greatest disconnect that he probably felt in those years was no news from Valentina. In 1937, she went to Russia, not knowing who was going there, feeling that she's going to go there with her husband to build a, a huge housing for the communism or the socialism, and disappeared, and nobody really heard of her. Adler was trying to use all the connections, all the influences that he had to try to find something about her. Wasn't able, letters were coming back undelivered, and nothing was no news. Later on, much later, about 10 years, after he died, uh, family was able to find the news and it was confirmed, I believe, I believe that in 1942 that Valentina was arrested uh, as a spy, which was common, which was customary in Russia in those years. And uh, in 1942, uh, she died uh, in one of the labor camps in, uh, in Siberia. So despite all this personal, environmental sort of disconnections and tragedies and feeling cut off the things that he felt comfortable with and felt part of, Adler still felt really, really embedded. The way he did that, he connected to humankind. He went across the United States, he went across the globe, and he did this work, and he still did his work, not talked 
the social interest and connectedness, but he acted and worked there and did that. Symbolically, as I keep thinking about that, um, even the way he died, not that anybody plans the own death, but the way he died, he took a walk in Aberdeen, and it was at that time a provincial uh, Scottish town, a, a, a north of Scotland, uh, right before he was supposed to give a lecture in Aberdeen University, collapsed on the street, being seen by many people. There were several accounts of just total strangers who just saw that happening uh, and died from a heart attack. I keep thinking, I keep comparing the way he died and a really, while connecting to people, by being surrounded by people and walking to the way how Freud died. Freud died a year after Adler. He outlived, he was extremely proud. He wrote on Adler's death. What an accomplishment for a Jewish boy born in Vienna to die in Aberdeen. Freud wanted to be an Englishman all his life. He achieved his dream about two years before he died. He moved to England to a fluent neighborhood in London, bought a three-story three mansion, and he died there in 1938, I think, was early 39, surrounded, he was, he was big in anthropology. His whole house, this mansion where he lived and died, is filled up until these days with stones and figurines of dead gods, and it's really dark. And it's really tall. The building is sort of tall. And I could see that Freud dying in this really vertical building. <laughs> Being surrounded by dead stones. <laughs> and Ender died on the street, walking horizontally. Being surrounded by live people. And that's wow. a metaphor that I, I went to London just this June, just several months ago, and went to Freud's museum. And I couldn't feel differently. That was the only way. I walked in there and said, I can see how he died. Now that I have a strange case of seeing things. <laughs> but that's a sense that I have. Very dark, a lot of stones, a lot of figures of dead gods. That's the only feeling that I, that I had. So, um, Freud never grasped the sense of social interest. Never grasped it. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But it's interesting because he wanted to be an Englishman. And for him, either, uh, you know, there is every, you know, there was an imperial topic, imperial theme everywhere. London and north of Scotland. For Freud, that was that bear that bore a significance. He died in London, surrounded by towers. Ander died in the countryside almost. Aberdeen was a really small town. There was not even a believe railroad. That the funerals had to be held in uh, Edinburgh, uh, a, a capital of uh, Scotland. So if the war is an abused social interest, I thought to do a little exercise now. And I think we, we, we I hope we fell for that because and I and I really I want to I want to think about that. I want to feel for that. If the war is abused social interest, what would be in your way of feeling it? An adherent understanding of peace. Yes. Well, I was just brought back to war is kind of giving your belonging, contributing you to that on the neutral side of life. And so in order to achieve peace, we have to transfer that to the useful side of life. So the peace would be, we, we meet our belonging and contribution and significant needs on the peaceful side of life, the useful side of life. It's just like a kid joins a gang, you know, when the world cup goes to war, they're just doing that on a grand scale. So it's a contributing. 
contribute and find your belonging on the useful side of life. On a useful side of life that creates peace. And that will create the peace. Yeah. Yes? Cooperation. Question yes. of connection. Mm -hmm. Ah, like this process thing. It's not just a connection as a state, it's a creation of mm -hmm. connection. Or war destroys connection. Well, check my spell and watch my spell. Anything else? Looking out for others. Looking out for others? Because I, I, I think. In a sense of peace, you're looking out for others. You want others to be peaceful also. You know, you don't want you to only be at peace. You want for others to And there's no peace. peace just within without peace on the outside. Yeah. I would say um, trying to see the world through the eyes of other people. I think uh, creating an abundance and sharing it uh, fairly. <clears throat> and sharing it fairly. Seems to me we have to make peace more exciting. Because I, I keep thinking, what's the seduction of war? You know, like how do you how do you get honored? through creating peace? How do you get importance through creating peace? How can you be a peace hero mm -hmm. instead of a war hero? That is really interesting. In 1906, that word topic was raised. Mm -hmm. the, the underlying cause of wars were found to be trying to find a place to show honor and to be patriotic and to contribute. And the war was found to be just a wrong way to achieve that purpose. That's still how the military advertises. Mm -hmm. That's true, right. This is true then. So how, how do people advertise peace? How do you advertise You know, I think, when I think of the word peace, I always equate it to like Christmas time. Well, well, no, but really, I think of it. Well, well, not not helpful. Well, <laughs> you know, you see, but that's, that's when you see the peace most, you know. Mm -hmm. um, wish you peace during the holiday season. Wish you joy during the holiday uh -huh. season. Um, so it's a time when we think of normally maybe getting together with family. Um, mm -hmm. Connecting, telling old stories, um, giving, um, you know, sharing food together with one another. Uh -huh. You know, so that's when I think of peace. So. And it is, of course, you know, I'm going to tell you my own Christmas story. Do you want to hear my Christmas sure. story? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> okay, you're going to hear a Jewish Christmas story now. <laughs> <laughs> Bottle up. <laughs> <laughs> a Soviet Jewish Christmas. Oh, really? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm gonna take uh, we immigrated. There was uh, we came here. It was December 28th in 1994. Uh, and my brother, of course, wanted to show us all the beauty of Christmas decorations. And some of the decorations were still on because it was still before the New Year. So the people were keeping it on. So he took us for a ride to, I think, Minnetonka, because he said those going to be the most beautiful <laughs> decorated houses. You see it all. So we were driving, because the weather was relatively mild, so we could drive for quite a while. And I was getting increasingly depressed. I had no idea. It was not, I mean, it had nothing to do with Christmas. And I meant no offense, no, I mean, I didn't even have a feeling for that. 
and somebody asked me, so what is it? And I said, well, uh, is that like, it was it like something happened? Did, it, did many people die around here? Mm -hmm. uh, the thing was that in all those nicely decorated houses, the thing that was sitting right on the door, right on the front door, was guess what? Aha. Uh -huh. And in the place where I came from, the only use for those nice things were on the state funerals. Like when Brezhnev dies and Stalin dies and some other people dies, this is what's been held and walked through at the very beginning at the very head of funeral procession. So in my mind, it just clicked. Somebody's dead. <laughs> Not of mine. It was probably at a really cellular level. Almost 14 years later, even though I'm perfectly aware what these things mean, and even though part of my family does the very same thing, and my grandchildren have been raised in a mixed religious background, religious upbringing, uh, the very first, very cellular reaction that I have when I see those, that particular piece of decoration is that <laughs> But the connection is the one that I get, a sense of connection. Now, the question that I always keep asking myself in my manner of keeping things complicated <laughs> is, what is the purpose of connection? Is that connection a purpose or is connection a mean? Because if we talk about social interest and a sense of embeddedness and a sense of connection that we do create as a way to promote the social interest, then is connection an ultimate goal or is it a mean? I think it's both. You made it simple. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it is, I think it is both, uh -huh. though. It's um, both an ends and a means in of itself because you need the connectedness to have one with one another. Mm -hmm. But then for you, I think it gives you the sense of the intrinsicalness. So I think it's, I don't know, I think it's a both thing. Mm -hmm. I think we're pack animals and we get very insecure when we lose our connection. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of why public speaking is so scary because you're apart from the pack. I love it. Okay. <laughs> the, 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 the threat of taking connectedness only as a goal and that is the mean, and then ignoring the goal, might be one of the fundamental reasons of all the wars. Because any war, the factual war, or anticipated and prepared war, the war of weapons or the war of wars, create this sense of connectedness. We are all in bed together, right? And we're gonna all defeat the enemy. And the oh, enemy yeah. that is, is to be defeated is getting connected to now. Oh my God, we are going to get defeated. We got to get together in that. Well, families that don't have a better way to bond do it that way. They hate the same neighbor, and mm -hmm. they can join us over that. Right. So it's just kind of a grand scale. Mm -hmm. We can't find a better way to join. Right. So we hate the same people. Right. But right. then you are joining. Correct. So right. are you disconnecting or are you joining? No, you're joining, but you're doing it in, in a useless purpose. Use, how do you see hating someone useful? Useless. 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 Oh, I think, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mona, Marina, I'm hung up on the idea of how can one be patriotic in a useful way? And I'm thinking, for example, of the Kennedys pulling us all together working towards the space exploration. Uh, I think now if, if we were all to join together to work at saving the planet, that it would provide community, it would provide patriotic excitement. If we, we yeah, we need that. a higher goal. You're right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and there is a, the, the social research shows that the super ardent goal is the one that unites people. Back in the 60s and 70s, they knew that. Now, here's a problem. How do we make 
uh, a connection, a linkage between this uh, a beautiful goal of saving the planet and the others saying, go get plant vegetables on any ground where they can grow. <laughs> and tangible, and doable, and practical, and that is a way of connecting two people and to this ground where vegetables are gonna grow. So, and, and he knew how to do it. And we're getting so smart that we almost don't know how to do it anymore at some point. Right. And that creates a lot of anxiety. The whole mass and anxiety is that because we're losing this sense of ground, we're losing this sense of soul and fingers, and then it, it, it's really uncertain, it's really unsafe, because then where am I gonna land? I think we create it on a theoretical concept, and on that theoretical concept, we lose sight of the practicality of the relationships. And I think sometimes we can, it's really easy to talk on a theoretical basis of connectedness, of social interest, with your mind shifts to food, but we really forget, we really do put it into practice, you know? And I think that's where the, where the rubber hits the road in many ways. And of course, we all have the same ideas how to do that. And I think that's what Adam was. He was perfect. He was not only able to talk about it on a theoretical basis, but then he was also to able to implement and encourage other people to implement as well. He wasn't afraid to be imperfect in the way that two rabbits died anyway. So he was perfect in combining the ideas and the practicalities of that, but imperfect in accepting the fact that rabbits died well, it's too bad, of course, but... And he, he, he still saw the positive of this, you know, in the sense of they were still able to make the connectedness of those two people. Right. Well, I just wanted to share something. That is, um, you know, being a person who has been in the war situation a couple times during the Vietnam War, uh, I sort of saw that the military attracts people into the war, into the service to be all that one can be. Mm -hmm. But that once you're in there, they transform you into giving up yourself for others. So they they get you under a motivational pretext of being and doing more than you've ever done now. And then they want to get you into the pretext of give yourself up for the benefit of others. So that's been my experience. And I would mimic that. Even not even being in the, in the military, not being in a wartime effort, but even how they go about doing, developing that in a person. Mm -hmm. So that fits your you know, your, your whole uh, presentation here of what you're saying. So then the task is that how to go back to this deep, to almost like autistic approach, like being able to see the detail. And, and, go ahead. Yeah. I, I think we all go through the same thing now, like we support the troops. If you don't support the troops, you're not patriotic and you're going to feel guilty. But uh, all of Adler's uh, compatriots, Danica, uh, Elaine Papanak, all of those, used to just scream out against these groups of patriots because they were then sheep being led into something. And it just reminded them so much of Hitler that that they were just so anti these groups uh, of patriots because you're not allowed to think anymore. Right. You either support the troops now or you're unpatriotic. Right. Yeah. I won't even buy those rolls of stamps with the American flag. I, you know, I, I want the Minnesota flag of stamps. Or I'm thinking that uh, I'm thinking that there's a new word, and I'm thinking about the word patriotic, and I think that you know the first five letters of patriotic are patriot which is the father, the father right? and whenever we get we get the most patriotic when we're in conflict you know this, this blustering masculine stuff and so i think maybe we need to have a new word which is matriotic, matriotic. <laughs> <laughs> i didn't say that i've been saying that for a long time because the patriotic stuff has is what gets us into war the matriotic stuff is what keeps us at home and exactly. loving one another and enfolding yeah. one another so Thanks for that. I'm on your page. Do you know that the first Mother's Day, um, was actually the first several years of the Mother's Day, was actually mothers saying that they were sick and tired of seeing their sons come home in body bags. Yeah. You know, it was How do you spell grand matriotic? Uh, because I thought if Adler yeah. was like a gentle grandmother then, then that would be not just matriotic, that would be grand matriotic. But, yeah. but I, 
So, Stop with spelling. So, so okay, yeah. grand, so okay, somebody yeah. help me. M A after grand. M A. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Okay. What? What? M A. M A. Oh, 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 oh! That's a wrong. <laughs> it looks wonderful when it works. Okay, M A. T R I O T. T R I O T. If you're gonna follow the yeah, T Grand Matriot or Grand Matriot, right? There you go. Cool. Yeah. So that was Adler, Grand Matriot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like Adler's definition of peace. Yeah. And the mother, you should think of Mother Earth too, you know, mm -hmm. so planting a garden with the rabbits and rabbits burrow under the ground, and of course the ground is also horizontal, you know, uh -huh. so there's this real connection with the earth as opposed to going up into the sky and dropping bombs. Uh -huh. And then adding a grandmother, and of course I'm on a personal agenda here being a grandmother, grandmother, the, the wisdom of grandmother, yeah. longer and of the longer vision, and uh, all together. Be able to so did create something? <laughs> that is true. That is true. Okay, so how do we sell it? <laughs> <laughs> I want to make a point that when it's peaceful and everything is fine in your life, it's kind of becoming boring, and you become too uh, kind of you, you you start to degrade, degrade. You know, you start learning. You you stop learning. You stop growing because. Everything is too comfortable. You don't need to be challenging yourself to do anything. So there should be something that will kind of keep you yeah excited, need, excite you. you. <laughs> need a better challenge than yeah. the challenge of war. Mm -hmm. Like the challenge of going to the moon with Kennedy. Yeah. Or the challenge of fixing the planet today. Exactly. There's plenty of things to do. But all the soldiers are doing that. Well, all of us are going to have plenty of work to do with all the returning uh, yes. men and women because they talk about how many of them are being wounded, but uh, they're beginning to see how many of them are so destroyed emotionally. It's going to be years and years and years of working with these people. And all the traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And they're now asking therapists all over to take in at least one of these for free. The government sends them over there, but now we're all supposed to in that memorable conversation in 1916, uh, as people who witnessed the dialogue when one of the elders friends asked him, so what, what Dr. Adler, what, 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 what do you have to offer us new that we didn't know before? Uh, a witness writes, slowly he tells us, he began to see what Adler was driving at. There was a low binding man to the universe, moving always in the same direction, and toward the goal that could never be reached, but which, ne but which never arrived. And as man obeyed this law and cooperate with it, he would develop in a direction that further universal welfare, but his cooperation with others was the price he must pay for this development. The ecocentric goal must be broken up. Social interest was the only goal for mankind, and every human being, ma human being must be trained toward it in childhood until it became as natural to him as breathing or the upright gate. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of that dialogue. In 1908, charity, sympathy, altruism, and sensitive interest in misery represents new satisfaction and which the right, which ordinarily tended toward cruelty, feels. The greater the aggression drive, the stronger will become this cultural transformation. Exactly what you all talked about. It's paradoxical, but this is what happens. In 1998, grade one of the address biographers, I want to say, wrote, the knowledge about how to teach people to replace the drive for power with a desire for love and cooperation has been shown to us by Alfred Adler. Possibly, if mankind becomes sufficiently desperate in the next century, the message will be heard by enough people. The door is still open. So the mm -hmm. question is, are we sufficiently desperate for that? And the book was written in 1998, right at the end of the century. Mm 
You think we are, Maria? I think we are. I am. I don't know if we are. I am. Not all the time. I don't experience this 24 7 on anxiety. I'm not at the point of hysteria. Uh, but at, at certain points, I know I reach this threshold mm -hmm. of feeling desperate mm -hmm. and, and helpless. And I think with the current situations going on, both economically with the political campaigns that are going on, with the wars, you know, I think we can start seeing a lot more of that. People are clamoring for that, um, for that cooperation, you know, for that, um, for that usefulness, for the positive aspects of it, instead of all the negatives. So I think in society, we're, we're feeling the swell right now that's going on. And maybe we'll subside, you know, after some of these things have dissipated a little bit more, you know, after the economic down, you know, if there's an economic downturn or after the campaign is, you know. But I think that society is feeling some of that right now. So. Do you feel it? I think so. What I noticed is when you can really tell how desperate a situation is getting is when the population starts moving around. Like I know the last election, the number of people that went to Canada in certain parts of the community was bigger than it had ever been since. Just during normal election, not because of the war, not escaping the draft, escaping the politics. It's interesting that you, know, you can see and it's in parallel. There's a lot of websites that talk about that now, you know. You'll hear people say that if you know if this doesn't get changed, I'm going to Canada or wherever. <laughs> so when, when one when individual person feels uh, desperate and hopeless, one of the signs of clinical signs of anxiety would be restlessness. Uh, the, a mass becomes desperate. The mass becomes restless and moves and it may not be really organized. It might not be really thoughtful. Uh, but it, there are going to be some movements. So it's interesting how the, a, a huge body acts as, as a single body, a huge body of people. And I wonder if our best approaches in dealing with an individual anxiety can work well, uh, best of their approaches work well uh, in mass situation. I don't know. Well, I see a kind of swing toward a spiritual um, awakening, too, that is really part and parcel of what, what Anna was talking about here. The, the drive for love and cooperation is popping up in popular culture all over the place, you know, um, in a way that it hasn't been talked about in the past, not in my lifetime. So I, I think, we're at, you know, in addition to the fact that they're moving away and becoming more mobile, they're also staying here and moving inside. Ah, so it's not just that it's outside, it's moving inside. Mm -hmm. And there, I think in the coaching world, I notice a large movement from taking my spiritual life away from an institution and running it myself, mm -hmm. kind of, mm -hmm. that people don't believe someone else holds the red phone anymore, that, mm -hmm. that it's here. It's it's here. Their, yeah, it's their own responsibility to make whatever spiritual relationships they make. and. Um, so that it's almost actually, like planting your own garden wherever yeah. things grow. So it's your mm -hmm. own that garden. Kinda, that kind of gives mm -hmm. me hope. Because when power gets amassed in any one person, no matter what the institution is, mm -hmm. is it seems to me when we are in danger, when people give away their authority over their own life. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we've tried greed and power on a large scale now. We've tried it, and we've seen <laughs> what it's gotten us. <laughs> now there's going to be a swing. <laughs> Well, and I know this is cyclical, but when you see um, different demographics mm -hmm. thinking and getting involved with like the younger generation, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that, I think that means we're poised for change too. But I think in uh, some respects, uh, you know, back to what you were sort of saying, when we're at peace, we separate as humans. When we're at mm -hmm. war, we congregate and get support. So I think a lot of times conflict breeds collectivism. Even though it is abused, mm -hmm. we do sort of uh, do that as a natural way of being human. Evolutionary psychologists have talked about that. Mm. 
I keep thinking uh, in the last 30 years, I've been waiting to see what's going to happen with China when they're only allowed to have one child. And I keep thinking when all those only children grow up, which they now are, they're not going to settle for what's been China. Right. Mm -hmm. Only children are going to do something. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Interesting. interesting that you bring up China because two thirds of those children are male and only one third are female. Well, except that one of the, one of the uh, characteristics of the only child girl is that they are fiercely independent. So there won't be very many more Chinese, I guess. Uh, well, <laughs> actually, they're in high demand since they since they got rid of all the girl babies. Now everybody's searching for a wife, so now they cost a lot more. Right. But they're not going to settle for the old male ideas. Right. But it's so. interesting because it's not they're not they are technically only children, but in itself. So we talk about the difference between biological and psychological birth order. It's almost like a super psychological firstborns because mm -hmm. it's not only they perceive themselves, they've been raised and thought and conceived as only yeah. men out there. Yeah. So uh, somebody says uh, that all the only children in China have six pockets, one for each of the grandparents and parents uh -huh. to put things in. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a lot to carry. Yeah. Is that <laughs> true or a metaphor? A metaphor. Oh, okay. That's a six packet. Well, if you only have one child on both sides of the family, it's, and now when you have something like that fire or the earthquake that takes away all of these only children, it's like the loss of the child is devastating, but the fact that you're only allows that to come. Yeah, I was just thinking about, like, the United States is a capitalistic society, and it kind of breaks the individuality. Um, and when we start talking about love and cooperation, it kind of, are you trying to make this country socialistic or something, mm -hmm. you know? Some people would be really opposed to mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there should be some sort of a balance, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I am for socialism, <laughs> but also in a balanced way, not like it used to be the European ideas of the former Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. That's the answer to socialism. Tarzan calls. But it's interesting at the cellular level, whenever somebody, when I see the word, whatever word containing social, appears before my eyes, before I see the end, would that be just social, just social, nothing else, or something more than, I feel a lot of an anxiety, because, you know, if it brings socialism, it, it, it's hard for me to go with that or buy into that. Uh, it, it's, it's in the cells, it's, you know, it's biological, I guess, I, you know, I like to think, maybe I'm in denial, maybe I should really overcome that, uh, but it is, um, uh, and interesting because that's why I, I had a really hard time to get the whole concept uh, of social interest initially. I, I, I knew it intellectually. I think I had it. You know, took the classes, I passed the test, I could lecture on that. Uh, but I, I, it took me years to start feeling it. That's why I was so impressed and I was so happy when I found these facts observed, the facts stated versus facts felt. Mm -hmm. And that 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 hit uh, home somehow. It, it, it made a lot of sense. It made sense up its own, but then it made a lot of sense. It, it illuminated so many other things uh, to me. Oh, uh, Marina, recently, uh, as part of a course that I'm taking on faith and politics, um, I did a web test, uh, and it was interesting to me. I mean, I know I'm a flaming liberal. Uh, but it was interesting because there were four quadrants. And one quadrant was authoritarian liberal. And another was non-authoritarian liberal. And I'm thinking, when we use the word socialism, we so often see it as authoritarian socialism. I don't think socialism has to be authoritarian. And I don't think that's the kind of humidity that uh, uh, that Adler was talking about. But that was a new concept to me. 
it's a 17th century, uh, and it's a utopian socialism uh, developed uh, uh, in Western Europe at that time that gathered, felt so connected and so, liked so much and thought this is all. The problem started when, uh, with implementation <coughs> of that, when it hit the ground, and what the belief was that the only way to really make it happen was to kill some people and replace some other people and dethrone some other people. This is when Adler started feeling really disconnected. It was part of the reason when there was some of the strains people believe uh, in marital relationship between Adler and Marisa because she was devoted, she was a, a, a card carrying member of the Austrian Communist Party and she was really devoted uh, to that idea. She was really difficult to persuade that, you know, this is, look what's happening, look at people getting killed, look at people getting lost. Uh, Adler felt it. I think that was his way of grasping the reality, his way of mastering reality. That's my feeling about that, that Adler did it through feeling. But people find ways to pervert any good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make it not a good idea, it just means somebody's misused it. Yeah. Can I jump to peace again for just a moment? And I was just thinking about this. You know, everything that I know about pe the peace movement is about a reaction against war. And I think that maybe the answers may lie in really focusing on peace, um, only peace. What is peace? How do we live it? How do we promote it? How do we connect with one another to keep pushing it forward, as opposed to having a reaction to war all the time? Uh -huh. Yes, because even the, one of the, the latest workshops called Nonviolent Communication. Mm -hmm. Well, we're saying what it isn't, not what it is. Mm -hmm. Why isn't it called peaceful communication? This is that, that was a thing that when I found this Google thing and the number of uh, war uh, for uh, entries for uh, war and peace. So somehow the only way to define peace is that for war is an anti-war. I can't it's help not to think war. about 1984 by Orwell. Mm -hmm. Because this is what they struggle, this poverty of language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and you believe that language is part of culture. Mm -hmm. and culture creates language, and language mm -hmm. reflects the maturity and richness of culture. That's a sign, or should be the sign. If we cannot define the thing on its own without saying, this is not what this is, mm -hmm. or what something else, some, some other things are, that's a red flag. That's a red flag. Well, uh, I think I, I, I achieved my personal goal not to, I, I tend to over talk and overdo and run over time. It's the first time in many years I haven't done that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I worried so much that, much that I'll do that I'll go over time. So I, uh, I did it. Perfect. <laughs> Three minutes left. Um, we might have a couple of minutes for a couple of closing comments, and uh, what I'll do, I want to uh, run it for the copier, and as we do it today, it will be somewhere now, uh, and the way out that works, because I like it, and I think we all create that it, it uh, should be copyrighted by a very master speaker. <laughs> the way to sell it, answering the question, how do we sell it? <laughs> all that, yeah. all by trials, and. I think that's a very playing thing. Yeah, that's a note. Can I just mention that I'm, for those of you who haven't received it, I'm handing out evaluation forms and also Marina's handout. And if you give me or drop it on that chair right in the front there where that envelope is, the evaluation I'd appreciate it. And I have a certificate for each of you, so. Thank you very much.